For those of you either in the audience or watching at home on Channel 11 or watching later uh, live streaming uh, or delayed streaming on rockvillemd.gov, um, you can tweet, you can post on Facebook, but if you'd like to tweet, it's at Rockville 11, which is our Rockville channel, or at Rockville 411. Um, I'm also at Cheryl Kagan, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter. Um, I'm going to once again, as I always do, ask that all of these candidates be respected and admired for their willingness to put themselves out before the voters. It is a really hard thing, and I know from experience. It's a sacrifice of time away from friends and family and work, and, um, and these are passionate people who care about the city of Rockville. So please, no booing. We even don't have uh, clapping until the very end. So I am going to ask you to please respect that out of fairness to all of our candidates. Um, tonight's debate is different than some of the others. The Twinbrook Citizens Association has chosen to do mayor and council together. As you see, they are all sitting together and they are seated kind of in affiliation, not in alphabetical order. And uh, questions, some questions will be directed to everyone and some will be directed uh, to just one candidate. And uh, I want to thank in advance Steve, our timekeeper, for uh, keeping us all um, fair on that front. Most of the questions are two minutes. You will get a 30 second warning and then when the red card goes up, um, you all know that I'm pretty strict about a hard stop and I will interrupt uh, in the middle of a sentence. So please make sure that you start to wrap up when the 30 second uh, card goes up. Um, so with that, I wish you all good luck and we will get started. Um, before we get started, I just want to recognize um, our wonderful Senator, Jenny Forehand, who's in the audience. She has served us so diligently and made such a difference in Rockville and Gaithersburg for a very long time in Annapolis. Thank you, Jenny. It's, glad, it's really good to have you here. Also, our current mayor, who decided not to seek re-election, and that's Phyllis Marcuccio. Thank you for being here. I'm just looking really quickly. I hope I haven't, I mean, there's so many important people and community leaders who are here, but in terms of elected officials, I think uh, that's who we have in the audience. If others, if I'm overlooking someone, uh, I will give them the shout out a little later. This first question is for all candidates, and I want to say, just as a disclaimer from the very beginning, I did not write these questions. Oh, former city council member Jim Marinin is in the house. Back to my disclaimer. I didn't write these questions. These were written by the executive committee of the Twinbrook Citizens Association. They work to try to make them as balanced and fair as possible. I'm going to read them as closely as I can to exactly the way they wrote them. But if you don't love the questions, see them, not me, okay? <laughs> All right, so this is for everyone. And it's going to start with Claire at this end and come down. And the other question that's for everyone is going to start with Virginia and go up. So that's the way that's going to go. Recently, some members of the City Council have discussed measures such as anti-mansionization regulations and neighborhood conservation districts that would limit homeowners' ability to make full use of their property as, as permitted under current law. These regulations would fall disproportionately on homes that are east of the red line on the metro. What is your view on the use of such measures? And for each of these questions, you'll have two minutes. If there is leftover time, though, because I'm not sure that you'll all use two minutes, um, if there's leftover time, we will allow closing statements, which are not currently budgeted. So you might keep that in mind if you'd like closing statements. So Claire Whitaker, could you please lead us off? Thank you. Yes. Um, I was actually at the East Rockville Citizens Association meeting. Uh, when this this conservation district was discussed, and um, it, uh, it uh, the the purpose behind doing it, I believe, uh, is that the citizens would like to have some protection from what is called mansionization, to have some control. And if everybody in the district joins the district, then um, there's some control over what can be built, similar to an HOA. 
uh, that some of the uh, communities have now. East Rockville doesn't have an HOA. Whether or not it's a good idea or a bad idea uh, is uh, something that has to be weighed. I think that they're, they're, we're exploring, we, this, the East Rockville individuals are exploring it right now. And um, the difficulty is that something like 85 to 90 percent of the people have to agree to do it. Um, and if they don't, then it, it will, will not, they, they cannot establish a conservation district. Um, <clears throat> the issue of mansionization is really a difficult one because you have isolated ins instances where uh, individuals have suffered from large uh, buildings. I will say here in, in uh, Twinbrook, I, I'm not sure that there is any major problem with mansionization. Twinbrook was one of those communities that was built as an expandable community. And the idea was that as you, you bought your home, and it was moderately priced, uh, if you had a family, you could pop up the roof and get more bedrooms. And I think many people have done that. Not all of the, uh, it's not all Levittown. There are various kinds of um, houses here in Twinbrook. And I think that a lot of them have done a wonderful job. Thank you. Don Hadley. Uh, good evening. I'm grateful to be here. One size doesn't fit all. I think that's what we're learning. There are neighborhoods in which the imposition of large homes that overshadow smaller homes and contrast with them are desired by the neighborhoods. And there are other communities in which uh, the desire to expand and improve homes prevails and the concern that something next door is going to be too large is not really there. The mayor and council have had on their agenda a, a thought of trying to find something that uh, is agreeable to everybody. Uh, I'm not on the council, but if I were, I think my approach would be first to look to see if there are some common grounds that are universally accepted and then leave other actions, if any, to the neighborhoods. One element of the current statute is that a 40% uh, vote or agreement of the people who are in a proposed conservation area, which is a totally voluntary thing, are required to propose it, and 85% are required to actually enact it. And the city attorney has, has signaled that she thinks the 85% requirement is not legal because it's an abdication of the mayor and council's discretionary responsibility to a citizen vote. So there's presently an amendment posed uh, to delete or do something with that 85% thing, if you will. So we don't know how that would turn out. But I, th I think the issue is more that conservation districts or whatever might come in, if anything, would be a matter of, of uh, local community initiative, if that, and then figuring out what if someone doesn't want to be part of that. And we don't have the answers yet, but that's what a discussion and hopefully a, a fruitful discussion that involves everyone's cooperation and incorporates everyone's ideas would bring result to. Thank you. Thank you, Don Hadley. Next is mayoral candidate, council member Bridget Newton. Good evening, and thanks everybody for being here. I'm gonna to try to scoot forward so you can hear me. Uh, I think Don hit the nail on the head, and that is that one size isn't gonna fit all in our neighborhoods. Uh, when this idea first came forward this summer, uh, there was talk in, the East, in East Rockville about um, conservation districts. And I think some of us and myself at the time thought, well, maybe that would work. However, I spent uh, half a day driving around Rockville with one of the Twinbrook citizens, and we had a great discussion about different neighborhoods and how uh, a conservation district would impact or not. Um, those neighborhoods. There's a big difference in Rockville between our older neighborhoods and our planned communities. And the newer neighborhoods that have HOAs are protected, and the older neighborhoods that don't have HOAs are left to their own uh, methods to come up with ways to protect themselves. It is a discussion, excuse me, a discussion that the next mayor and council will need to have. I think it's going to require a lot of work by the individual associations, a lot of work by staff. Uh, Twinbrook has a neighborhood plan that was approved in 2009, the same time our zoning ordinance was rewritten. I think that they both need uh, some work. I've been reviewing your plan, 
it's very interesting that it consistently refers to the 1982 plan for Twinbrook. And things have changed dramatically with our, um, our growth in Rockville. One of the big issues we've got to look at in our zoning districts is the transition zones. Our transition zones are not protecting our neighborhoods. And we've got to find a way to make sure that they do that. Um, so I guess to repeat, I'd like to redo the zoning ordinance. I'd like to or reevaluate the zoning ordinance. I'd like to have each neighborhood take a look at their plan and see what we can do to meet each neighborhood's needs, knowing that they're not all going to be the same. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Newton. And the next person is Council Member Mark Prashela, also a mayoral candidate. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being here and for Twinbrook Citizens Association for hosting. Um, I, I walked extensively mostly in the summertime through Twinbrook, East Rockville, and West End, which are typically considered to be the neighborhoods most affected by mansionization. And I got very mixed reactions. And, and personally, I never brought it up myself, but people brought it up to me. And, and there were you know, some who said they, they were against mansionization, but just as many who said, I don't want anybody affecting my property rights. If I want to build a bigger house or be able to sell it to somebody who wants to build a bigger house, that should be my prerogative. So I think uh, coming to terms on mansionizations can be very difficult. I um, have been looking at the deliberations in 2008 by the previous mayor and council on this very topic, and they spent probably four hours over four different work sessions talking about mansionization, and they started out very strict, but what they enacted was a lot less strict than, than what they initially started. And it all has to do with grandfathering and the ramifications of that if, if your house is already violating a, a new standard. Um, when I was president of the College Garden Civic Association, I fully participated in the new zoning work sessions on behalf of the neighborhood, and one thing that we wanted was an absolute peak height, and we got it. Uh, we, we wanted it for um, accessory buildings, but it was also extended into um, the, uh, for, for all, all homes. So that it used to be the measurement for a house was halfway up the gable. You still have that, but now there's an absolute peak height, and I think that's helped quite a bit. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Prashela. Next is Julie Polakovich Carr. Back to candidates for council now. Well, good evening, and thank you to the Twinbrook uh, Citizens Association for organizing tonight's event. Um, as the owner of a two-bedroom, 800-square-foot house in East Rockville, I can certainly understand the desire by some people to expand their homes. Uh, my husband and I bought our home as newlyweds, and I think there's a lot of other young families in East Rockville, Twinbrook, and other neighborhoods that that's what they can afford to start out with is a starter home. And over time, as their family grows, they need their house to expand. They like their neighborhood. They want to stay in the neighborhood, but the house just isn't adequate space. That said, I, I believe in the, the rights of property owners, but I think it is appropriate for the city to set uh, maximum sizes in terms of height, setback from the property lines, and things like that. I think perhaps part of the trouble and, and the discussion now in terms of mansionization has to be, are the adequate metrics, um, or the current metrics adequate in terms of balancing the rights of a, a homeowner that wants to expand versus the rights of their neighbors? Um, in regards to conservation districts, uh, as has been mentioned, East Rockville has been contemplating this, or at least some residents in East Rockville have been thinking about this as an option. Um, I'm a little bit troubled by some of uh, the, the proposals that are, that are being discussed right now in the city. We certainly want to be in compliance with the law, and the city attorney has deemed that the current uh, a uh, standard of 85% may not be complying with the law. We certainly need to address that. However, I don't think we want to get into a situation where a minority of property owners can uh, set up a conservation district when the majority in a neighborhood do not want it. Thank you. Thank you, Julie Polakovich Carr. And the next candidate for council is Beryl Feinberg. Thank you very much, Cheryl, and thank you everyone this evening for coming out in this rainy weather uh, to be with us and spend your valuable time. Similar to the others up here, I would say I do not feel there can be a homogenization of the mansionization idea. One policy is not going to fit all. Our neighborhoods are very different. As I have walked and knocked on thousands of doors, I have seen that when I walk in Twinbrook, if I walk in 
King Farm in Orchard Ridge where I live, East Rockville, Lincoln Park, our neighborhoods are very different and we all, the one thing that has come through as a theme to me is everyone really treasures his or her neighborhood. And so what I would like to see is that we do not look for one approach. We may have to have different approaches in the different neighborhoods. There are a variety of tools. If you look at the mansionization packages and the information from the planning staff, they certainly survey many different uh, items uh, that we should look at in terms of architectural design, different ratios. Uh, I know Mark has also considered a ratio and brought it to light for us. So what I would like to see is all of our neighborhoods coming together and looking towards the future and finding a common ground. I do understand the individual property right issue. However, I would not to want to be where someone has taken a uh, 800 or 1,000 square foot home and then build four house, a four story house next to me where I lose my shade or my view that I particularly purchased my house for. So it is definitely balancing the rights of the existing homeowner with the neighborhoods. And um, so I think that we would need to look at a good balance of that as we vision the future. Thank you. Thank you, Beryl Feinberg. And next is council candidate, council member, Tom Moore, please. Thank you. Thanks to the Twinbrook Citizens Association for sponsoring this. Thank you, Cheryl, for so ably moderating. And thank you for coming out tonight. It is a miserable night. Um, Mansionization is something that I've thought about for a long time. Uh, I actually studied it specifically in law school, wrote a paper about it, about 50 pages long, that took Rockville as an example, but looked all around at what other people were doing about it. Rockville hasn't solved this problem, but it's not for lack of effort. Really, no one has solved this problem well. It's a really difficult balance between allowing people to do what they want with their property and being protected from your neighbor who's doing whatever he wants with his property. Um, those are opposing values, and in, when you look at mansionization, you try to meet both of them, and it's, it's not a good fit. Um, we are looking at our requirements here. It's, as uh, Mr. Hadley mentioned, there's a 85% requirement right now to create a neighborhood conservation district. Uh, we have to pull that out of the law because the mayor and council has to be the one to make the final decision. When we had the session on that, I asked the staff to come back and give us language that would suggest to future mayors and council as strongly as possible that roughly 85% of a neighborhood should approve of something before the mayor and council would approve it for an area. We have to be very, very careful before we take people's property rights away. I mean, it's, when you talk about a neighborhood conservation district, it sounds great, and it is great for some places, but essentially what you're doing is you're saying to somebody, you used to own your property free and clear, and now you don't. There are things that you can't do with it anymore. Um, and one thing that I found talking to people too is that one person's mansionization is another person's improving property values. Uh, so it's, when we talk about the problem of mansionization, I think for half the people in the city, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity, uh, which makes it doubly difficult to uh, actually crack down on because I think a lot of people do not want us to crack down on it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Tom Moore. And wrapping up this question is Council Candidate Virginia Unley. Good evening. Um, first of all, I think this is going to take city staff, elected officials, and neighborhood representatives really rolling up their sleeves and working together. I can tell you that I have been personally affected. I looked at a condo that was just a couple doors over from mine, and I said to the person who was selling it, how come it's so dark in here because I get the morning sun and the afternoon sun in my condo? And she said, we used to get the sun, but when they built the Capitol Bank building, it blocked off the shade, so it was a very dark condo, and I refused to purchase it because I have this thing with as much light in as possible. It's, it's really hard to strike an even balance because people want to preserve the characters of their neighborhoods. And if we allow too much mansionization, then the person who just wants that quaint cottage and, that, and bought the, the house in the neighborhood because of that home is going to feel violated. So I really think that the end result is we really have to work together and hear everybody out in all neighborhoods so that we can preserve the character of the neighborhoods for the majority of the people who are going to live there. And also try to, to let the ones who want their mansion expand just a little bit. Thank you. 
Thank you, Virginia Onley. Thank you to all of you. And I know you're used to generally having opening remarks, but that's not the way this debate was designed. Again, one of the other differences in this debate is the Twinbrook Citizens Association chose to put the mayoral and council candidates uh, on the same panel and do them concurrently. There are some questions, though, that will be directed just to the mayoral candidates. Um, I just want to recognize that our former county first lady just walked in. Barbara Duncan, a Rockville resident, welcome. It's very nice to see you. I wasn't trying to out you for being late. I'm sorry when I, <laughs> when I said just walked in. She's been here for hours. That's what I really meant to say. Sorry. Okay, so the, this next, these two questions are directed for a mayoral. Uh, candidates, and they are on a similar topic, but they are separate questions. So, Council Member Bridget Newton, this first one is for you. When asked about charter amendments, you replied that you had concerns with increasing the council from four members to six and would never want Rockville to go to districts. However, after the elections, we could end up with an all West End City Council. Please explain your thoughts about the importance of geographic diversity on the City Council. How should any city council fairly and equitably represent the entire city, including Twinbrook? It's a very interesting question because you could also end up, should those people apply and run and get the um, names on the, to be on the ballot, you could end up with a council from any one of our ten neighborhoods, districts in the in the city. So it's interesting that there were enough people from West End to actually make that a happening. Should it happen, I don't think it will, but I think that's not what we should be worried about. We should be worried about the council members representing everybody, and there's just as much opportunity for someone from any neighborhood to come forward and run for council or mayor. So, um, I, you know, I, that hasn't been something that we've ever faced before. I uh, don't know that, that that's a significant issue for for the city, I think the most important thing as a mayor and council is you need to represent the entire city of Rockville, no matter the neighborhood you're in. I certainly don't represent the West End any more than I represent East Rockville or Twinbrook or Falls Mead or Rockshire. I, I expect of myself, and I think I do, um, deal with anybody's issues and anybody's concerns throughout the city. So I, um, I, I, I haven't seen that that's an issue. Thank you, Councilmember Newton. The next question is for Councilmember Mark Pershala. The question is, the Team Rockville website says that the slate was formed in order to give voters a diverse choice with candidates of different races, ages, genders, professions, and from different neighborhoods. Expand on your theme, please, of the need for diverse representation on the council, and tell us how such a council can fairly and equitably address the needs of the entire city, including Twinbrook. Thank you. Um, yes, we did put together a team this year, Team Rockville. I'm very proud of that team. Our diversity is both obvious and not obvious. The obvious diversity, gender, age, race, you can infer religion and other items, and also geography. We're diverse geogra geographically speaking. I think that is very important to have that diversity. But we put this team together based also on policy diversity. I'll give you a couple examples. I recruited Julie Plakovich Carr onto the team. I knew she had been on the Environment Commission. I knew she had been a co-chair of the City Services and Budget Working Group for the Summit. And I knew she headed up the APFO Committee for the Planning Commission. But when I talked to her about coming on to Team Rockville, I didn't ask her at all what her opinion was on the APFO or what her opinions were on the environment. It just wasn't the issue. What the issue was, was she qualified? Was she in leadership roles? You know, could she come to the table and have a decent policy discussion? Beryl Feinberg is another example. I met Beryl when I led the Finance and Budget Task Force. And you know, she is an incredible budget person. She's worked 15 years with the Office of Management and Budget at the county level, wh whose budget's about 40 times the size of Rockville's. And so I valued that budget expertise. I did not ask Beryl, how are we going to cut the budget? I did not ask her what her priorities were budget-wise. What I valued was that she could come on to the council and do 
bang up job on the budget like nobody else in this city could possibly do. So that's how the, the team was put together without reference to there's no um, uh, litmus test on any issue. What we were concerned about could we bring diversity both professionally and policy wise but really expertise wise onto the council. Thank you council member Prashela. We're now going back to questions for everybody. I want to remind you again, you don't have to use the full two minutes if we want to have closing statements. Um, sometimes brevity is to your benefit. The first question is for council candidate Julie Polakovich Carr. And all of these questions are drawn by the Twinbrook Citizens Association from each of the candidates' either websites, public statements, or campaign literature. So that's the source of these. So, Julie, you have talked about how you enjoy walking from your East Rockville home, albeit your, your small starter home, uh, <laughs> to the urban town center environment, as well as using the metro. As a two-term member of the Environmental Commission, how would you incorporate parks, recreational facilities, and green space along Rockville Pike that the residents of the apartments in the new mixed-use zones uh, could access on foot? Thank you for the question. Um, I, I have served for over three years on the city's environment commission. Environmental issues are very important to me personally, and I've been hearing that as I've been out door knocking in many neighborhoods for many residents. People clearly value their parks, the wonderful rec uh, centers like the one we're in tonight, um, as well as uh, the green spaces and few remaining open spaces in Rockville. Uh, clearly, planning for the future of Rockville Pike is going to be a very important task for the mayor and council, the next mayor and council, um, both in terms of providing those kind of recreational opportunities for residents. Um, I've said before that I think it's important that people in every neighborhood have access to parks and are within walking distance. Clearly, certain parts of Twinbrook uh, do not have those opportunities. and adding uh, parks and open spaces, public spaces, as part of plans for redevelopment on Rockville Pike will provide opportunity to both the new residents that would be coming into new development as well as to existing residents in our existing neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Julie Polakovich Carr. The next question is for Claire Marcuccio Whitaker. And the question is, and uh, who's a council candidate, uh, you have said that you do not want to take on more long-term debt or increase taxes. How do you anticipate funding major long-term infrastructure projects like the anticipated replacement of the city's two bridges over I-270 or the repair of the John Brown Bridge in Twinbrook and still stay within the city's financial management policies? Well, if I could take that question a little bit, sorry, a little bit further. <clears throat> I think what I, my position has been is that we don't, want more debt. We shouldn't have more debt in these economic times. I, I, I couch it on that because I look at Gaithersburg. Gaithersburg. Gaithersburg not only has no debt, but indeed they have money in the bank. They have $65 million in the bank. Some of it is designated for things like repairs and, and uh, construction sites, but the other is in the bank earning interest. I think what we need to do is start thinking about buying that debt down, and when I say buying the debt down, uh, we, we carry a $5 million debt servicing charge right now. That set debt servicing charge would pay for the mayor and council, the city attorney, and most of the city manager accounts. That $5 million would pay for the in the the uh, enforcement section of the police department, the, the patrol teams, and there would still be $700,000 left over. So I think what we're doing is we're not looking right now at the, the problem of, of uh, a budget in the right way. We, we need to start thinking about how we can conserve, where we can cut out, and then we'll have the money without having to borrow it. And I might add that uh, one of my uh, can the candidates that I, that, is, that I am opposing has said we're, we, we basically have no interest, that we've got free money. But if you look in the budget books, that's not quite true. We have many, many debts, and they are between 2 and 4%. That might be lower than most of our mortgages, but it's not no interest. Thank you, Claire Whitaker. The next question is for council member and council candidate Tom Moore. 
The state legislated a tough ethics laws for municipalities in 2010. You were very active in lobbying in Annapolis and championing the, championing the adoption of the ethics ordinance at the city as well as at the state level. And why do you think the ethics law is important for Rockville citizens? And if you want to give any specific examples as to what motivated you to get involved, that would be great. Yeah. Um a couple years ago in Prince George's County, Baltimore, there were a couple of scandals uh, that caught the attention of the legislature. And they passed uh, for cities, counties, and the school boards a very strong ethics uh, reform package that required all of those folks to start disclosing their financial conflicts at the same level that state employees do. Um, they passed unanimously through both houses and has been the law of the land since 2010. Um, it took cities and counties a little while to get, uh, to get that in place. Um, you had to pass it through the state ethics board, and they had to pa pass off on it before you could actually go through. Everybody, and you kind of had to do them, everybody had to do it one at a time. Um, as some cities started to get closer to having to actually make this their law, they started to get cold feet about it. Um, and there was an effort, um, uh, partially led by one of my colleagues on the council, uh, to weaken that law in Annapolis, to uh, not require us to disclose as much as we, as the law said we had to. Uh, and when it came time to, uh, to pass uh, Rockville's law to actually set up our ethics commission and change our reporting standards, there was a st steady and um, almost relentless uh, desire to weaken our standards here too. And I think that's wrong. I think s strong financial disclosure standards increase citizens' faith in their government, that the reasons we're making decisions one way or the other is because we think it's the right thing to do, not because we have a financial interest in it. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an important part of, of democratic governance. Um, I don't hear people saying, I think I should know less about my public officials. I think my, less, my public officials should be less honest and less transparent. I don't hear that. We should be more transparent. The state law was a good idea. We passed an even stronger version of it here in Rockville partially with my leadership, partially with Councilmember Prashela's leadership. Um, it was the right thing to do. It's, it's going to make us a better city. Thank you, Councilmember Moore. Uh, the next question is for Council Candidate Beryl Feinberg. You have cited your extensive professional experience with Montgomery County government as the Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer in the Department of General Services and in the Office of Management and Budget. Rockville residents pay extra taxes and fees for the privilege of living in the city of Rockville and getting those, um, those services. Fees for stormwater management are approximately 25% higher than what county residents pay and 75% higher for recycling and trash services. Do you see the Rockville fees as appropriate and do you have any suggestions about what city fees or taxes could either be cut or increased? Thank you, Vera. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, yes, I do have more than uh, 14 years of experience at the Office of Management and Budget. I think when you look at budgets, it's like looking at a huge thousand-piece puzzle. And that's how I've always framed it. You have some that fit, some things that don't fit. You need to look at revenues. You need to look at user fees, which is you have just alluded to. And you need to look at expenditures. Uh, you need to be a, have a crystal ball and try and prognosticate, prognosticate the future and what those revenues would be. I do need to also say that despite the best efforts of any municipality, I don't care whether it's county, whether it's Rockville City or any, nobody could have predicted the great recession that began in FY10 when we were all doing budgets across this, across this country. Um, in terms of the user fees, as being on the Finance and Budget Task Force, we looked at some of the fiscal policies and the user fees. I think it's a balance. You need to look at the base, basic level of services for all of our city residents, whether it be in the recreation area, whether it be for um, trash pickup, what is the basic level of service, and what is the enhanced level of service. And usually user fee policies are geared to those folks when it is an enhanced level of service or an enhanced benefit that there is a user fee. So for example, the camps would be basically, uh, should be more self-supporting. You also have things like the trash pickup. It is an enterprise fund. You have general fund in your Rockville budget and you have a specific um, 
enterprise funds, which are sort of like a business and should be self-supporting from the fees and from the services provided. And in the case of Rockville, our citizens and residents have demanded a superior level of services, one might say, that um, are available in things like trash pickup. And we have made an enormous commitment to that and providing for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beryl Feinberg. The next question is for council candidate Virginia Onley. Virginia, you serve on the Rockville, uh, the Board of Rockville Housing Enterprises, mm -hmm. and you supported the purchase of the Fireside Apartments by Rockville Housing Enterprises. Could you explain, please, why you supported that purchase, which required a $32 million mortgage, and please mention any other ideas that you have for expanding affordable housing in Rockville? Okay. Well, I did support it because we, as Rockville Housing Enterprise, have the right of first refusal. We didn't know. We knew that Fireside Park was going up for sale, so we had to wait till an offer came in. And we thought at the time, we discussed it, and we said, okay, it's probably going to cost us $22 million. Well, the offer came through. It was $36 million. But after much deliberation, we decided that it was the right thing to do because there were 236 families whose uh, homes were protected be because of our purchase. If we would have, we felt that if we would have allowed the rich corporation to purchase Fireside Park, then they would have, they already had the layout for a very expensive clubhouse, and we knew that uh, the rents at Fireside were always moderate to low. So we wanted to make sure that we could protect that. That is probably my greatest accomplishment being on Rockville Housing Enterprise, that we were able to keep 236 residents of Rockville in their home. And had some of them been displaced, they would have come to the uh, executive director and her staff at Rockville Housing Enterprise. It was simply the right thing to do. I support it. Um, the city helped us, the county helped us, and it, it was just a win-win for residents of Rockville. And that's what I like to do most, represent everybody, whether they have money or whether they are just out of college on their first job, helping them provide a good life for themselves in Rockville. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia Onley. The last question goes to council candidate Don Hadley. Don, you have said repeatedly that you just want a seat at the table. While serving on the Planning Commission, you applied to, uh, replied for, applied for, sorry, and received an appointment to the Charter Commission, and you also, you served on both commissions, therefore, concurrently. You are now running for the City Council, along with four other West End candidates. What kind of underrepresentation do you see in this council race, and how does your candidacy promote diversity on the council? Thank you. Uh, I would comment that our seating arrangement underscores a certain competitive nature that doesn't necessarily have to extend in this campaign. It, it implies that if you're going to vote, you must vote for a slate person uh, if you want to vote for any of them. So I think the diversity we need is a diversity of thought, that it's perfectly fine to have people who at the starting gate have different ideas, who maybe think mansionization goes one way or the other, who thinks development is too large or too small. My approach is that I don't care if we disagree coming into it. I want us to sit down. I want us to talk to the public. I want to bring the public into it. I don't want to preach to the public. I want to listen fr from the public. Out of that process, you have to do something. You have to be willing to be vulnerable. You have to be willing to trust that the best idea is going to come out. I entered this on the last day of the race because I couldn't believe that other than my immediate candidate to my left, your right, Ms. Whitaker, who I didn't know was entering the race at that time, nobody from anywhere, it doesn't matter that I'm from West End, nobody was entering this race. You have a uniform, it's like a one-horse race. I can't believe that. And the fact that people on the slate differ in their professional backgrounds to me has nothing to do with the fact that I see them in their public statements and actions of generally favoring and moving quickly for what I would call too much urbanization, too quickly moving on ideas before the public has a chance to get into them. I'm for slowing it down, having thorough discussion, 
And if my ideas are wrong in terms of what the public thinks, that's fine. I just want us to get a rich, good for the better of Rockville environment, and that's why I'm running. Thank you, Don Hadley. Um, Steve, I'm going to throw you a bit of a curveball. If you could set your timer for one minute. Um, because we only get one choice for mayor, I'm going to ask Councilmember Newton and Councilmember Pershela, of the questions that were asked of the council candidates, please pick one of them. Uh, one of the issues, give them one minute, Steve. So it was everything from town center and pike, traffic and open space and rec areas, infrastructure improvement, uh, ethics, budget and affordable housing. Pick any of those five and uh, please take one minute. And uh, Council Member Newton, if you'd like to go first, just for one minute, speak to any of those five, please. Well, I'm having a hard time deciding which one I'm gonna talk about, ethics or fireside. So I think I'll try and hit on both of them. I was never against the ethics ordinance, as has been alluded to. Uh, what I tried to balance was how much information is enough information to ensure that your public officials are abiding by the standards set forth in the code and are not divulging too much information that is therefore putting them and their safety at risk. Uh, I, we had no problem in the state over the broad discussion. We did get down to the brass tacks when it came to how much information you had to put out. In terms of Fireside, I was for Fireside when it was an unknown public, a private entity. Once we met with Pride Rock, they assured us that they wanted to maintain the housing that was currently at Fireside and that they would use their own private resources to make improvements that are very much needed. I finally decided that it was a bridge too far for a public entity to do, and I ended up voting against it. Thank you, Council Member Newton. Council Member Prashela, one minute for you, please. Thank you. I'm going to speak about Fireside Park Apartments because that was a very controversial issue. It first came to the attention of the Rockville Housing Enterprises April, May 2012, and Councilmember Newton was right in on it at the start. Councilmember Newton knew and helped recruit the, uh, the uh, Department of uh, Housing and Consumer Affairs to execute the right of first refusal, and it was her task to inform her colleagues, her elected colleagues, to um, come in on the deal, to, to know about it. But we didn't find out about it as a council until August 2012. There was a three or four month gap where we could have known about it, where we could have explored the financial ramifications, where we could have had a much calmer process. And that did not happen. And so we came, it exploded on us, and it was, became a very contentious issue. I support the Fireside Park, what Virginia didn't mention, it was vastly privately Stop. funded. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prashela. As soon as the red goes up, sorry. Okay, we're going to shift back to two minutes for this question, which is Twinbrook related, and then we're going to go to a minute and a half for the following round. So I just want to give you a heads up, and I'll, I'll say that again. Um, but since we're in Twinbrook, I think we've got to give a lot of love to the Twinbrook issues. Um, and thank you again to Twinbrook Citizens Association and their leadership and residents for being here tonight and for hosting this. Um, this is just a general question. What do you see as the two most important problems facing Twinbrook and what do you propose as a solution? And we're gonna go up the table this time with starting with council candidate Virginia Onley, please. Well, I, the first one I think is development. Um, we wanna make sure we don't grow too fast and too strong. And um, the other one, I believe, would be the uh, Children's Resource Center. And I think those are two major things facing Twinbrook at this time. Um, you want me to bring them up? Do you want me to elaborate on them or just whatever I want to say? You've, you've got my, two minutes. In my two You're minutes. You're good. Okay. Um, you know, as I've said before, what you need, what we need, we Rockville needs, is to make sure that we all listen to each other and we bring every stakeholder to the table. And when a community has an issue that they feel that they're not being represented, then we need to put on the brakes and stop and listen to Twinbrook or, or West End or Americana or Lincoln Park to figure out what we can do. So any issue that's facing Twinbrook, I wanna hear about it. I wanna roll up my sleeves and help you get those issues resolved. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia Onley. Next is Council Member Tom Moore, candidate for Council. 
when I've been talking to people, I think the, the two things that jump out at me are Twinbrook's aging housing stock and then the pressures on the neighborhoods from the Rockville Pike Corridor. Um, it, it's a, you know, Twinbrook was a, immediately post-war development. Uh, it was put up very quickly. It was put up inexpensively. It was meant as starter homes. Um, over time, some of them have been replaced. Some of them have been beautifully maintained. Some of them not so much. Um, it is, um, for code enforcement, it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a tough problem in the city. Um, the, the housing stock is older. It's not always as well maintained. There's a lot of renters in certain places. That is immensely frustrating to neighbors who are trying so hard to keep their streets clean and their yards beautiful and their streets beautiful. Um, I think that is going to be an ongoing issue in Twinbrook. Uh, that it's, I, I'm not seeing that one um, solve itself anytime soon, but that's something that both the residents and the city have to wrestle with. And on the pressures from Pike development, it's, you know, the, the city has a, you know, we, we have a, a, uh, a goal of maximizing the great asset that the Metro line gives this city. I mean, it's, it's one of the absolute um, things that makes Rockville as valuable and, and thriving a place as it is. Um, so we want to make sure that, that we do have an appropriate amount of density around metro stations so that we'll have new communities there that can walk to metro and stay out of their cars and really live a very, very different lifestyle than we've seen. Um, but when we do that, we need to make sure that we don't put too much pressure on the adjacent residential neighborhoods. Um, and it's, it's tricky because there, you've got small single family houses fairly close to the Twinbrook metro station. Um, and most uh, neighborhood plans really show uh, a good deal of protection about that, but there's, there's a lot of questions about just how much separation you have between large development and residential houses. That's something that the city and, again, the community are going to have to wrestle with for the next couple of years. Thank you, Councilmember Moore. Next is Beryl Feinberg, candidate for council. Thank you. As I have walked in Twinbrook, what struck me, not just in Twinbrook, but actually in other neighborhoods, uh, is seeing that the population, the demographics in this city, and in, in Twinbrook as a part of it, there is an aging population. And as I have said on my website, and I continue to say that one of my priorities is services to seniors. I want to make sure that every senior in Twinbrook and the rest of Rockville who wishes to stay in his or her home can stay that way. I have seen firsthand with a father who had Alzheimer's the difficulty when you have to say to an aging parent, you can't drive anymore because you're going to kill yourself or kill somebody else. That happens to many of us as we as adult children face the caretaking arrangement. I think in Twinbrook, as I've knocked on, I've seen many what I would call shut-ins, folks who are perhaps late 80s, early 90s, who are in need of help with activities of daily living, with recreation, and I would like to make sure that there are more senior navigators to help the people who are living in Twinbrook as well as other areas of this city to access the services both in the, from, available from the city, from our nonprofit partners, and from the county. So I would say, and having seen that in the homes uh, that I have knocked on. The other priority that I would see for Twinbrook is the, the issue of housing stock, and particularly is with, is with the older population. They sometimes, they are on fixed incomes. They may or may not have the mental faculties to even realize that they need a ramp or they need a railing. So I would like to see some help in our seniors and others for improvements to their homes so that they can stay in them safely. Thank you. Thank you, Beryl Feinberg. Next is council candidate Julie Polakovich Carr. Well, as a resident of East Rockville, I, and I think there's a lot of issues that uh, my neighborhood and Twinbrook actually share, and having not walked through Twinbrook now twice speaking with residents, um, I'm hearing a lot of the issues that come up in, in, in my neighborhood as well. And I think one of them actually is crime in the neighborhoods, particularly around the metro stations. You know, there was an incident today at Twinbrook Metro Station. Um, I actually had the opportunity uh, several months ago to do a ride along with a police officer um, as he did his patrol uh, on east of 355. And I was shocked to learn that there are only two police officers that patrol the whole eastern part of the city. There's six in total at any given time patrolling Rockville. And uh, given the, the crime statistics on the eastern part of the city, I felt like that was woefully inadequate. There, these police officers are also responsible for enforcing traffic on two busy roads, Veers Mill and part of Rockville Pike, and to also be patrolling 
along the neighborhoods, perhaps we're not getting adequate coverage there. So that's something I'd like uh, to address if I get elected to the mayor and council to make sure that our neighborhoods are actually safe. Um, the other one actually, I'll go back to Rockville Pike Plan. Clearly the proposed development and the planning that's happening right now for Rockville Pike will have an impact on Twinbrook, not just around Twinbrook Metro Station, but development that happens along the pike on the other side of the metro tracks. Uh, we want to make sure that we're hitting the right mark in terms of density and building height so that new development isn't overshadowing the single family homes that are on the other side of the tracks on Lewis Avenue. Um, and that uh, really that new development that goes in isn't just serving the needs along Rockville Pike, but it's going to be compatible with what people in Twinbrook and the rest of Rockville want. Thank you. Thank you, Julie Palakovich Carr. And now we'll hit our mayoral candidates on the way up the table. Council Member Mark Prashela, please. Mayoral candidate. Thank you very much. I spent 14 days knocking on doors in Twinbrook, and they were the 14 hottest days of the year, I guarantee you. <laughs> It took me five hours to make it up Lewis Avenue, and by the time I got to Rock Crest, the, the man at the door said, what do you stand for? And I said, I forgot. I mean, I was <laughs> <laughs> But I, I did, um, in Twinbrook especially, if somebody wanted to speak at length, I spoke at length, and I spoke at length uh, even to one set of people for about an hour, and I learned a lot in Twinbrook. And uh, I, I could easily give many things, but the ones I'm going to enforce uh, uh, emphasize our code enforcement and traffic control. And, and basically what's going on here is a, a lot of Twinbrook people told me they didn't feel they were cared for or the city wasn't paying enough attention. Uh, for example, um, you know, the stop signs that were chronically run or uh, heavy traffic, too heavy traffic on some streets, and they would call the police and of course the police would come out the next day, write a bunch of tickets and then disappear, and a week later the problem was occurring again. So that, that's why I put one of my uh, planks on my platform was a different way to measure the effectiveness uh, of city response to things. Um, code enforcement I think is an issue in parts of um, Twinbrook, not in all of it by any means, uh, but, but I think uh, it's complaint based at the moment and, and maybe we should look at a different scheme, you know, that, that would require more people and city staff looking around uh, and actually being a little bit proactive on the code enforcement. Uh, but you only asked for two, I could do more, but I think that'll be enough for now. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Prashela. The other mayoral candidate would be Council Member Bridget Newton. Thank you. I think the, <clears throat> excuse me, the overriding issue is our adequate public facilities ordinance. It affects everything else. It affects our schools, our home values, code enforcement falls under that, traffic falls under that, tr tr transition zones fall under that. We need to have adequate inf infrastructure in place before we build <coughs> development. Nobody is for inadequate development. I can't imagine that anybody wants portables at schools or n traffic not moving. We've got to fix this issue. Um, I think then, because adequate public facilities ordinance would help us get the schools, then our home values will increase. Most significant impact on our, school, on our home values is the schools that our children go to. And we've got to fix that issue. We've got to work better with the county and our state delegation to get money for school construction in Montgomery County. You can't get it just for Rockville. You have to get it for the whole county. But I think if we go to bat and work for it for the county, we can bring it home to Rockville. Um, if we have good schools, then we have good neighborhoods. If you have good neighborhoods and your home values increase, people take care of their properties. I agree we need to do more with code enforcement. That is throughout the city. When I knock on doors in Twinbrook, I hear the same things I hear in East Rockville and West End. We need more people paying attention. One thing I've learned over the years is that in Rockville, code enforcement is by people calling in. So if there's an issue in your neighborhood, you have to call the city and let them know. Otherwise, nothing will be done. So it's up to us to be proactive. It's up to us to make that phone call. And I think a lot of people don't know that. The same goes for traffic. And we do need more police officers. I supported, and through my MML work, I was able to get money. So we have two more police officers this year. I would propose that we have more than that. We have 59 sworn officers in a city of 62,000 people, and we almost doubled during the day because of all of our infrastructure in town center. In town Thank center, you. excuse me. Thank you, Council Member Newton. Now we go back to council candidates, and Don Hadley, you're next. Thank you. Well, in rank order of importance, I will say ditto as to the combined 
development and APFO issue. That is how we continue our path, whatever we determine it to be, in a way and in a scale that doesn't uh, be destructive of our neighborhoods uh, and of our schools. And in looking at the data for your Twinbrook Elementary School here, 54% of the school population is Hispanic. 17% of the school population is Asian. So I'm sort of surprised tonight there really aren't many, if any, representatives from those populations here. So when we talk about how we're going to face issues such as APFO and development and budget and code enforcement and police presence and everything else, we need to speak to some more people. So I would just raise that to the, even though they're not here, I would like to speak to and for those people. And in going through your neighborhood, I found so many people who really feel disenfranchised, not just language barrier, disenfranchised. The Asian uh, neighborhood group that has been here has actually ceased to function. The Hispanic neighborhood group that has been here, they tell me they've ceased to function. We have some real work to do to be really representative of Twinbrook and to protect this neighborhood by a, a betterment of the relationships. Not that I'm not saying people are fighting or squalling. It's just there's an indifference. It's an alienation, and we need to overcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Don Hadley. And the last person to answer this question is council candidate uh, Claire Whitaker. I think that the most important uh, uh, factor for Twinbrook to consider right now is that it has a council that will protect the APFO from waivers that would permit uh, developments to not have to consider school capacity and traffic. And I say that because Twinbrook is, is, is right where it's going to be happening, the Rockville Pike Plan. We, we, we don't have that in place yet, but we do have developments going up. The one that is currently just, just broke ground will have 1,600 units in it. Those 1,600 units will have at least 2,500 cars because the studies show that each car, each, unit, each residential unit usually has 1.6 cars. So you have 2,600 cars. If there are additional uh, 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 apartments or condominiums going up, th there'll be more cars. But what is also an extremely, I mean, something that absolutely has to be considered is what's going on in White Flint, because that ha will have tremendous impact on Rockville Pike. White Flint is putting up, in the first phase, White Flint 1, uh, 9,600 units. So that translates into 15,000 cars. The second phase will have 9,600 units. So you're, gonna t you're talking about more than 30,000 cars. Now, you know, you'll say, oh, well, they won't use their cars. But other studies show that only 25% of the people use mass transit when, when they're near a, uh, within a half mile of metro. So I think that Twinbrook, of all of the areas that are close to the metro, has the most severe problems with, with, the, with the issue of, of development that is not wisely managed. And that I would recommend that the Twinbrook citizens consider. Thank you. Thank you, Claire Whitaker. So it's interesting to me the great diversity of issues that came forward on such a, an open-ended question. I'll be curious uh, to hear the conversations that go on around kitchen tables and around, uh, around this room afterwards. We heard everything about crime at the metro to traffic control, development, the adequate public facilities ordinance, uh, development along the Pike Corridor, aging housing stock, the Children's Resource Center, uh, care for seniors, development. I mean, that's, that's a pretty broad range. So thank you, candidates. That was all. Those were very interesting. Um, before we go forward, I want to acknowledge that former delegate who served with me in Annapolis and did a great job representing Montgomery County, Paul Carlson, a Rockville resident, is in the room. Thank you, Paul. Good to have you here. Uh, reminder, Steve, we're shifting to one and a half minutes for these next questions, so we'll have to be a little more concise. And the first question is for Council Member Mark Pershala, a candidate for mayor. Mark, 
The city has experienced considerable turmoil with personnel, including claims of discrimination and harassment, uh, lawsuits, resignations, and high level, uh, of our high-level managers. Uh, Saul Ewing's outside investigation cost the city about $200,000, but you said that you won't read it. Um, all authority has been delegated to the city manager and the city attorney. How can you evaluate and correct any systemic problems, and what if there are issues that involve the offices of the city manager or the city attorney? So could you speak to that issue, please, broadly? Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. There are actually two parts to the Saul Ewing report. One was investigation of specific personnel issues, allegations, and when mayor and council commissioned Saul Ewing, we um, pledged absolute confidentiality, but, but you said, you know, mayor and council can't look at that. That's by charter in our code. That's not something that was just made up. We are not in the, uh, the reporting authority of the city staff. It's the city manager who's the head of the city staff, with the exception of the city clerk and city attorney, city manager. Those three people report directly to the mayor and council. So we, by law, by Maryland law, cannot see the personal details. However, we are, uh, one of the things Saul Ewing said, you needed to revise a personnel manual, and they evaluated the personnel manual. And as we have now got a draft personnel manual in, we did see the Saul Ewing markups on the personnel manual. That was at my request. So we have seen part of it. Um, going forward, I have proposed in my uh, platform that we hire a third party law firm that we can you know, who does this kind of thing, who can, uh, on behalf of mayor and council, because we can't see personnel details, you know, ensure that the new policies are correctly implemented, that we have uh, consistently applied procedures, and, and that's how mayor and council can make sure that this is uh, going forward. And I will say the, the, the staff have adequate protections, and I see I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prashela. Uh, the uh, next question is for council member Bridget Newton, also a candidate for mayor. Uh, recently, in an article in the Sentinel, uh, which is a newspaper, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's printed on paper. It's a totally cool thing. Uh, I recommend it. Check it out sometime. Uh, in, a, in an article in the Sentinel, Bridget, you said you were in favor of reading the report the City Council commissioned from the Saul Ewing Law Firm investigating allegations of discrimination and harassment of city employees. Can you please explain why, if you were elected mayor, how do you plan to go about dealing with the personnel problems in city government, Rockville City Government, and if you could just speak to what Councilmember Prashela talked about in terms of legal constraints about what you could and couldn't actually do in addition to how you would deal with the systemic problems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I said I was in favor. I think I said I supported. Uh, the mayor and council are elected by the people and we represent the people. We uh, charged the uh, city attorney with hiring a firm and we paid for the report. I think the mayor and council after a year and a half should see the report after the names are redacted. I have no interest in anyone's personnel files. However, I do have a strong responsibility as a council member and maybe as a mayor of protecting the interests of our employees. And if our employees are not being protected and not being well served, that is an issue in the city of Rockville. Our current city manager was not here during the issue. She is not to blame for the problems. However, I do not agree with the decision which was not the decision going in, that the mayor and council would not see the full report. Uh, we do have the policies. We are reviewing a, a, some plans to, we are reviewing um, changes to our policy manual. Thank goodness it was in a shambles. And I think going forward, we will be in a better place as a city. But I strongly support our employees. I strongly disagree with Councilmember Prashala's suggestion that we hire another law firm. That is not what we need to do. We need to have steps in place to protect the people that work for the city of Rockville. Thank you, Councilmember Newton. Um, before we go forward, there was a lightning round question that the Twin Brook Citizens Association wanted asked. So you all each have your cards of yes and no. <laughs> Sorry. So. Um, okay, first question. Am I the most fabulous moderator ever? Yes or no? Okay, no. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, stop, 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 stop. Okay, uh, the first question, sorry, the first lightning round question is, uh, if you were elected, 
Will you read the Saul report? Do you believe that the mayor and council should read the Saul report? Yes or no? And please put the direct, please put your the sign up that you correct, believe. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on. So there is a difference of opinion on that one. Um, okay. Now we're still in minute and a half, and we have questions for our candidates. We're going to lead off with council candidate Beryl Feinberg. Beryl, most of the density mandated by the Rorzor rezoning in the Rockville Pike Plan is concentrated in the, uh, on the southern border of the city and will disproportionately affect Twin Brooks roads and schools. Neighborhoods in the western border, such as the neighborhoods of Ritchie Park, will be isolated and protected from its effects. How would you propose to equalize the burdens of development? And how will the revenues generated by development be applied to the local communities that would be most affected? And that's a minute and a half, please. Okay. Um, thank you, Cheryl, very much. I think one of the, uh, this really gets to the heart of the APFO and the APFS. And what we would need to look at here would be um, what changes do we need to make to the APFS such that um, we could encourage more denser development and we could apply the smart growth standards. I think in the part of the city that you have been talking about in, in Twinbrook, if I understand your, your question, um, I would like to make sure that we would be able to look at schools being built on time. The schools are not really within the purview of the city. They are funded by MCPS. They are approved by the county council. We can certainly advocate as a city for the building on time. Using the APFS, I think that we need to look at the thresholds. They are different between the city and the county. And I would like to see that we can um, move to make improvements in the APFS such that schools would not be delayed construction because there is a moratorium in place. In terms of the revenues, I'd like to direct those revenues towards um, improvements in the Twinbrook area, sidewalk repair, road repavement, and amenities, park areas, open space, gathering spaces, so that folks can get together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Beryl Feinberg. Uh, Don Hadley, council candidate. The city of Rockville spent $530,000 on a consultant's report for the Rockville Pike Plan. Since that report was submitted, the Rockville Planning Commission has spent another two years in workshops and hearings and has made changes to the consultant's report. Now transportation issues seem to have gridlocked that plan. And as chair of the Planning Commission, um, what would you say is your personal vision for solving the traffic conundrum, please? Thank you very much. I'm not personally going to be able to solve the <laughs> traffic problem. We have gridlock. There is a proposal for a rapid bus transit corridor to go down the middle of Rockville Pike. Am I missing? I just want to make sure you can be heard. Just hold it closer. Yes, All thank right. you. Which is uh, a, an interjurisdictional matter, which has been brought to us. It's coming up the pike through White Flint, and it's going to be in the middle of the pike there. And so we've been addressed as a planning commission with high recommendation that we insert it into the middle of Rockville Pike. Whether that will do anything for our traffic remains to be seen. It's largely a commuter rail. At most, it will have two stops in Rockville. So it's not going to do anything for local traffic. So what we're trying to do with the Pike Plan, which is still very much evolving and is much different than what the uh, consultants gave us, is to create alternative streets, to create side roads, which we own, not the state highway, which can alleviate traffic in the main lanes, at least for local traffic, and to also create alternative uh, modes of transportation. Is that going to solve the problem? No, it's not. It's not, and we know that. So I won't say we're giving up. We're working hard to resolve it. But the truth is the scale that we build in the city has to be carefully aligned with the fact that a lot of the traffic we have here, we can't help. Stop. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Don Hadley. <laughs> um, the next question is for council candidate Julie Polakovich-Carr. 
Julie, you served as chair of the Adequate Public Facilities Committee, and you wrote the majority report that facilitated uh, greater density or allowed greater density than most citizens' representatives on the committee were comfortable with. In fact, the majority of the citizen representatives submitted their own minority report. How do you justify this more developer-friendly report from the APFO committee, please? So I did serve as chair of the APFO committee. I was appointed by the Planning Commission to serve on that task force and actually, actually selected by the other eight members of the committee to serve as chair. And we spent 10 months delving into the APFO and the standards that implement the law and really examining what works with the law and the standards and what wasn't working. And the committee, and I agreed with, uh, said that the city should have a safeguard in place. There was no discussion of removing the APFO, but there, we made a number of unanimous recommendations to change the standards that implement the law. I actually disagree a little bit with the premise of the question um, in that the all nine committee members signed off on the report. We did allow for any committee member to include their additional views that went beyond the consensus of the entire group. And so a number of members did submit minority reports. But if you look at the actual votes on the recommendations that we made uh, in terms of changes to the traffic standards, to the fire and emergency services standards, and to uh, the water and sewer standards, there were, we were unanimous in the, making those recommendations. Um, I think that there's a number of opportunities that uh, that the mayor and council uh, could take at this point in terms of improving the standards that implement the law, particularly in terms of traffic, and that's what the committee found as well. Particularly as we talk about the future of Rockville Pike, uh, there are opportunities to be taking a more holistic view of uh, traffic impacts from new development along the pike, uh, rather than the single building by building approach that we're taking right now. Thank you. Uh, the next question is going to be for council candidate Virginia Onley. Virginia. A recent city council meeting addressed allowing developers to pay fee in lieu of moderate priced dwelling units rather than provide the moderately priced units as part of their multifamily housing projects. Um, developers are already allowed the fee in lieu uh, method to opt out of providing trees, parks, and arts uh, on their sites. As the only candidate who lives in an apartment building, could you please discuss your view of whether fee and lieu arrangements work for the community in mixed use development, especially in the high density development proposed for Rockville Pike? Fees to opt out of the uh, moderately priced dwelling. Oh. Mm -hmm. I disagree with that because I think that being on Rockville Housing Enterprises Board, that we have a list of 5,000 people when we open up, we have times when we open up the list for people to apply for, for housing. And the first day we get 5,000 hits. And there is such a need for moderately priced houses that for the developer to opt out for a payment, I don't think will work. I think we need to do what's best for the community. And what's best for the community is to um, move on as far as providing moderate, home, moderately priced homes for, for our Rockville citizens. There is this, this um, myth that everybody is rich in Rockville, and that is absolutely not true. I'm one of those people, and uh, uh, that's why I've championed affordable housing, and I disagree with that. So, Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> uh, the next question is for Claire Whitaker. Uh, council candidate. Claire, you have stated that even with mass transit nearby, most residents in the high-density mixed-use zones within walking distance of a metro station will not use mass transit, but will continue to use their cars, thereby increasing traffic congestion. How do you think that the adequate public facilities ordinance should be applied around the metro stations in order to address these problems? I think that the adequate public facility ordinance right now does take into consideration just just these things, and uh, I think it, it should be applied. I don't think that there should be waivers. Um, I, I didn't make up those statistics. They, they come from the Maryland uh, County Planning Department, uh, the, um, the census, and the, they're all uh, the... the, the uh, transit-oriented development site uh, discussions, or reconnectingamerica.org. Uh, these are all 
uh, the, all these studies show that you're going to have people using their cars to go to work, to go to soccer practice, or take their kids to soccer, to go shopping, and, um, and only 25% 25, 25 actually use the, the metro, so. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Claire Whitaker. Uh, the last question is going to Council Member Tom Moore. Uh, Tom, the long-term plan for Rockville could result in doubling the population of the city. With much of the new housing concentrated at the southern edge of the city, do you support adequate public facilities ordinance waivers if such waivers would result in overcrowding in majority-minority schools such as Twinbrook? And if you could please discuss your thoughts more broadly on applying APFO waivers. Sure, thank you. Uh, Councilmember John Hall and I, uh, he was one of the original authors of the APFO in 2005 and has been one of its fiercest defenders since then. He is basically in this city, Mr. APFO. He and I sat down and looked at the standards a couple months ago and basically said, there's a lot of reasons that these are not working for us. The city keeps getting sued over these waivers, lots of lawsuits. We almost lost our planning authority over a fire and rescue fight at College Gardens Elementary that didn't have to happen because the, way, because the standards weren't very well written. And in Town Center 2, we're not getting the kind of development that we want. This city invested tens of millions of dollars in Town Center 1, and the idea was to be a catalyst for all the areas around it. What we're getting in Town Center 2 are low-rise buildings, uh, uh, drug stores that are one story. Uh, it's, not the kind of, um, it's not the kind of bustling, dense, alive after five, um, metro-friendly community that that the town center master plan calls for. And the reason is because the standards don't do the job. Um, so basically we, we took a look at those things and we said, look, one thing that the uh, mayor and council should be able to do is consider whether school standards should be waived in those areas because we have more than, school standards are an important goal of this city, but they're not the only goal of this city. We have smart growth, we want our downtown to be healthy, we want the area around the Twinbrook metro station to be healthy. Um, basically the waiver problem, uh, waivers have been put on hold. They're going to go back to the Planning Commission. Mr. Hadley's going to look at them. Uh, and we'll get a, lot, we'll get a citizen input Thank you. That. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore, Tom Moore. Um, we now have two questions for our mayoral candidates. And again, I'm trying to keep you guys together rather than just in the mix. So as our, the folks here and the people watching at home especially can kind of keep track. Um, the first question is for Mark Pershala, Council Member Pershala. You keep citing mass transit as a panacea for addressing all of the pain of urbanizing density around our metro stations. With metro cars completely filled every rush hour, and with King Farms Corridor Cities transitways not built, and the bus rapid transit proposals years away from being approved, uh, let alone funded or built, uh, what solutions would you apply right now for the inevitable traffic and congestion that is coming to Rockville Pike? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, you have to separate growth from development. They're not exactly the same thing. Growth is births exceeding deaths, as people moving in exceeding people moving out. And we have growth now. We will have it no matter if we have an APFO or not. And the problem is how do you handle the growth? We have had underinvestment for decades in transit. But we know that more people are moving in and you're not going to have very much more road space available. And what do you do with these people moving in? So the, um, you, you try to build mass transit corridors. It's unfortunate that some of this will take years to come in. I spoke to Metro the other day. Uh, there's actually a plan to have all trains come out to Shady Grove, all eight car trains. But that's going to take till 2024 to complete. Question is, what do you do with all these people? If we spread them out, they are stuck in cars. And they will further crowd what we have. That's, that's the issue. So I, my plan is that we have focus density where you have or can have mass transit. Um, and then the other part of it is mixed development, which works very well. If you can satisfy your basic needs by walking to the store, you're not getting in your car. I will say that we lived in Crystal City for nine years, and our car maybe was filled up three times a year because we use the metro and we walked to where we needed to go to get our basic uh, needs taken care of and that's how it works. Thank you Councilmember Prashela, candidate for mayor and now Councilmember Bridget Newton, candidate for mayor. Thank you. Um, sorry, your question. Oh, sorry. I was answer uh, sorry. 
it's probably it's similar but not the same. Again, all of these questions were written by the folks uh, in the Twin Brook Citizens Association. If you love the questions, I'll take the credit. If you hate the questions, I didn't have anything to do with them. <laughs> Council Member Newton. You championed a change to city law that gave the mayor and council special oversight authority for development in town center. Why did you feel that other areas zoned for mixed use, such as the area around Twinbrook Metro that is already zoned for more apartments than town center will ever, that, that town center will ever see, um, did not merit the same level of oversight that you thought was necessary for town center? Uh, what protections would you offer for areas like Twinbrook? Well, once again, let me set the record straight. My original proposal was to include transit areas. I didn't have enough support on the council to get all of that done. So I stuck with what was most imminent, and that was town center. I felt that the mayor and council, once again, I'll say it, are responsible to the people. The city of Rockville has invested over $50 million in our town center, and phase two needed to be successful. And what was coming forward, I didn't feel, was in the best interest of phase one. Um, I, so I won't go into more of that, but there is a lot more. Uh, in terms of protecting all of our other neighborhoods, Twinbrook and, and East Rockville right along the metro, I totally support protecting them, and that's why I am not for waivers in the APFO. Until we get our schools built, until we increase our traffic um, capabilities, until we find other ways to do things, we can't, we can't afford as a city who values our quality of life to have waivers on the APFO. I want to talk about transit for a minute. It's easy to use Metro when you're not taking children to soccer practice or you can live or work right on a Metro station. It's much more difficult if you don't have that opportunity, if your children play hockey or football and you've got to get them places. You can't do it on a Metro, on a metro line. So I have been a supporter of BOS, Bus on Shoulder, which would go down the middle of 270 from Frederick down. Um, I've done that through the MML. I'm in favor of a trolley system on Rockville Pike. I've worked with Gaithersburg and the county. A trolley we could do soon. I'm not talking about a trolley with overhead wires. I'm talking about a bus system that looks like a trolley. As Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Newton. Uh, I'm going to throw in another curveball. One minute, please. I would like to get, this is going to be something that is not Twinbrook, but is citywide focused. And we are in the 21st century. We are also in the high-tech corridor. And I would love to hear from each of you about your attitudes towards the Rockville City new website and about social media in just in a minute. So just super briefly, do you use social media? Do you believe in it? Do you think the city uses it well? What do you think of the new website? Pick anything of that just as social media and communications and give us your thoughts if you would. Uh, I will start with the, uh, where should we start? We'll start with the mayoral candidates. Council Member Prashela, why don't you start? And then Council Member Newton, we'll go from there. Yes, I think the city's new website is really a vast improvement over what it used to be. It certainly will organize. It's a lot faster. The searches are a lot uh, more inclusive. Um, and, and it gets a lot of hits. It's a very important way for people to know um, not only what the city has to offer, but if they want to do research on a particular issue, it's very easy to do through the website. As for social media, this is such an involving beast. And I, I'll say beast. Uh, I do use Facebook, for example, uh, and some other things. But um, it, it's just very difficult for the, the city should use all the social media, but it's very difficult to know how effective that is. And, uh, you know, something that's really nice, though, is they do have the alerts, the weather alerts, other kinds of alerts in the city. If you sign up, you can get alerts on your cell phone. I think that's a great service that the city has provided. Thank you, Council Member Prashela. Council Member Newton. I think the new website is an improvement. It came through the Communications Task Force, which I introduced and proposed and we approved back in 2009. Um, I am disappointed that we continue to do outside, use outside consultants. I think there is a lot of um, intelligence and expertise in the city of Rockville among our citizens. We had a couple citizens who applied to do that website and I would have liked to have kept that money at home. Um, I think that social media has its place. I don't think its place is during a mayor and council meeting. I think the job of the council is to deal with what's in front of us. Um, I think if there's staff people that would like to tweet and get the word out, that's, a, that's another issue. And personally, I have a Facebook, as some of you know, for the campaign, and I enjoy seeing the comments on there. But I don't know how people have time for all of the social media. I personally do not have time to do it all. So uh, that's what I think. Thank you, Councilmember Newton. Uh, Virginia Onley. 
Council candidate. Okay. Well, first of all, the uh, new website rocks. And if you look at the main page, it's a night view of Americana Center. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we recently redid our plaza deck, and I was looking for something online, and all of a sudden, wow, there was Americana Center. So it really is a great uh, website. <laughs> and as far as social media, I am so old school. I, 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 I must be the last person who really has been active with social media. I bought a campaign person on Rico, who's my communication person, and I tell you, if you look at me on Facebook, you would think that I was the Facebook <laughs> guru. <laughs> but I am getting there when it comes to social media. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia Onley. Uh, Don Hadley, why don't you go next? I use the uh, website intensively and refer people to it intensively. It's a great source for the zoning code or for any other basic items that you have to have. It's also a good start for community activities. I am not a social media butterfly. I don't have time, or at least I don't think I have time, so email is still my main portal. But in communications, uh, if that need increased, then I think I'd have to go with it. Thank you, Don Hadley. Uh, Beryl Feinberg. Thank you, Beryl. I think you need to look at what your residents and businesses and different communities want. Um, for example, yes, I do think the website is much more navigable. I do. Uh, have some questions. I am hoping and assuming that is ADA compliant because the ADA law does apply to websites also, not as not just construction. I'm going to assume that it is, but it is a huge issue. Uh, I would like to see it more la language friendly to people who are speakers of language other than English. Um, but I would also like to see as another multifaceted approach that we do outreach more to the local Hispanic radio on the local Hispanic radio stations, in the Asian newspapers. We need to be where our different ethnic communities and populations are. We can't impose to them and say that you have to use the social media. Uh, so I would like to see it a multifaceted approach. It's a generational issue too. As I knock on doors, I am sure that some of the 90-year-olds are not Thank using you. it. Thank you, Beryl Feinberg. You. <laughs> uh, Claire Whitaker, your next place. I think the website is a lot better than it was. Um, it's, uh, it, you can find things a little bit e easier, although I, I will say I looked very hard for the first debate and I couldn't find it, so not uh, altogether sure that, that the information is there right away. I could find it easily, more easily on YouTube than I could on our website. Um, but I, I agree with Don, the, uh, you can find code ordinances and and information that you know you really need to if you need to know it you can find it there I like the fact that you can see what's going on at the mayor and city council you know what the agenda is so that you can go the, the minutes are there and the fact that you can sign up and find out what's going on uh, subscribe to the uh, to the, the bulletin board I think is a great idea thank you Claire Whitaker um, thank you uh, I also looked to find the last debate online, and I couldn't find it, and I searched pretty hard. So hopefully somebody at Rockville 11 is going to make that easier to find. Uh, next, Julie Polakovich Carr, please. Well, I think the New City website is a big improvement and is much more user-friendly now. I'll just highlight two improvements that I, I think the city was smart to make. One is the translation services, and now that you can translate a lot of the web pages into a multitude of languages. Um, the other, actually, is one that might not be so evident, which is uh, that the city now is offering online forms for, for instance, the Rainscapes program, where homeowners can get a rebate for installing a rain barrel or doing other things to keep stormwater from running off their site. You still do have to do a paper, uh, a paper um, permit for that uh, and uh, mail that in. Now there's a web form. It's not just easier for applicants. It's actually good for the city. The city uh, uh, staff don't have to duplicate duplicate uh, the efforts there by manually entering that information. So it's, I think it's an efficiency thing. In terms of social media, I definitely think that the city should continue to be involved with that and might actually step up a little bit there. In today's day and age, people aren't getting their news from one source, so we need to take a broad strategy that includes Rockville Reports, the city website, and social media. Thank you, Julie. And wrapping up then would be Tom Moore, Councilmember Tom Moore. 
Well, I was a web designer in a previous life, so I, I watched the, uh, the evolution of the website pretty carefully. They were brave to start from scratch and basically rebuild the whole content management system behind it instead of just doing a facelift than what we had before. I think it's better. I think it's much, the search is much better, and that's really important these days. Uh, it's still a work in progress. Some archival documents need to be loaded on. Uh, the mobile site uh, is improving but needs more improvement. As far as social media goes, I think the city does a good job. They have a good YouTube channel. Actually, debates and this kind of thing, all the political stuff is not on the city website because of some federal rules that are under debate. Um, but uh, social media is something that I've, I've tried to bring to the mayor and council. I uh, introduced a Twitter hashtag, RKV Council, uh, that would allow citizens to create a conversation about what was going on during mayor and council meetings instead of just shouting at their TVs the way most people do. Um, didn't go over so well, uh, but uh, I have high hopes for that. Um, I also have a council blog, councilmembermore.org, where just today I wrote a long article on uh, the Saul Ewing report. Um, so if you go Thank there, you, you can find that. Thank you, Tom Moore, Council Member Moore. We're going to shift to a lightning round. So if you can get your cards ready, please. Um, the first one. As you all know, and as folks at home may know, there are three ballot measure questions. So the first question is, will you see, how do I do this, it's a yes, no. Uh, do you, will you be governed by the outcome of the popular vote on these questions? In other words, is it your call or is it whatever the people say? So will you be governed in your support on any of these questions that we're about to go through uh, by what, how the voters vote? So yes, whatever the voters vote, absolutely, regardless, even if I disagree, then vote yes. And if it's no, because I, ha I might disagree or there are shades of gray or whatever, then that would be a no. So that's the first question. Whatever the voters say, I abide by it. Please lift the yes. If you're not willing to make that pledge, then that's a no. Yes, that's what I said, on all, the, on all ballot measures. Okay, so we've got some mixed opinions. We'll keep that up and let the camera just, did your camera got that? Okay, now you can put your cards down. And let's see, how are we gonna do this if you're undecided? So I know that, so no, 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 no. The next, that's what I'm, that's where I'm about to go. Now this, this, that first question is a yes, no. Now there are the questions that, that everybody's gonna be voting on. So the first referendum, is extending the term from two years to four years. So if you support extending it to four years, you'd vote yes. And if it's no, I like it the way it is at two years, vote no. If you're undecided, then just do exactly what Council Member Newton said and just put it kind of horizontally so we don't see an answer. Yes is extending, is expending to, to, extending to four years. Okay, and if you can just raise yours, Julie, so everybody can see, okay. So everybody wants to extend to four years for what that's worth at home, that's up to you. The second question is gonna be expanding the council, the city council, from the current uh, four to six. So four members of the council plus a mayor to six council persons and a mayor. Again, if you support expanding the council to six, you're gonna vote yes. If you're opposed to it, like it the way it is now, it's a no. And if you're undecided, just put your, your voting card horizontally, please. Nice and high. Okay, did the camera get all that? A lot of diversity of opinion on that. And the third and final question that's being debated is about moving the elections, if it's four years, from odd, odd year terms like 2013 to presidential years, um, to, to gubernatorial or presidential years. So whether it's two years, presidential, Okay, TCA, don't give me bad questions here. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so if they're four years terms and it was concurrent just with presidential, so if it is passed that it's a four-year term, would you support it being shifted it to happening at the same time as presidential elections? And if yes, yes. If it's yes that you support that, please indicate by indicating by raising your yes, the no, and undecided. Okay. So did the camera get all that? Are we good? Let's, let's raise those one more time, make sure that the camera people have a chance to do that, and folks at home can see what people think. Okay, this is what I was asked to do. 
Sorry. You can use, if you want to clarify your, your opinion. So we're electing, we're electing people, and you all are people, and if no, you no, are a council I, member. I'm not understanding your question. I'm sorry. Oh, our very first vote was, would we feel bound to follow the vote of the people? And now you're asking us whether we would support something else. Uh, the question, I mean, is it a personal thing? Yes, this is how oh, would you be voting. This is only personal. You have influence. Everyone up here, all of us, presumably as activists, have influence. And so if you say, absolutely, darn tootin', this is a yes, I believe strongly in this, you have the opportunity to tell your friends and supporters and neighbors, I support this and I think you should too. So it's how you would be voting uh, and, and as a leader, how you believe that should go. Okay, so thank you. Um, the next question, it's going to be just a minute, please, Steve. Um, and we're just going to include all of you in this. It's about something that Senator Forehand and I both supported in Annapolis, and that is speed cameras. Don't hate us. We've all gotten a ticket or two, and some people have gotten a lot more than that, I know. But, but it's about safety, and it's also, it's definitely about collecting revenue. So there are millions of dollars that the city has collected uh, in this, from the speed cameras located in Twinbrook, and yet that money has not been spent enough, according to the Twinbrook Citizens Association, uh, in Twinbrook. And so the question is, um, rather than spending it in areas like West End on brick sidewalks, um, if you were elected, would you support allocating some of the speed camera money revenue to addressing pedestrian safety concerns in Twinbrook, such as lights, sidewalks, and bus shelters? So I'm going to start with the mayoral candidates again first. So council member, uh, I don't remember who went first last, so Bridget, do you want to go first? Councilmember Newton. Be glad to. I absolutely support spending it in Twinbrook. But I, I want to say that the role of the council is to work hard for every neighborhood. And since I was elected in 2009, I have put the needs of East Rockville and Twinbrook first and foremost. And I've been the one who's advocated strongly for a lot of measures in East Rockville and Twinbrook. So please, please know that. Um, Unlike in King Farm where we got money back from a developer and that money had to be spent throughout the city, the money that comes from speed cameras in Twinbrook should very much be spent in Twinbrook. Thank you. Mark? Conqu uh, Council Member Prashela. Um, I try very hard when I'm on my bike to violate those speed cameras and I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, nevertheless, um, you have to realize that just like the money from the King Farm this is city money, so the city money should go to where the need is greatest. But I happen to think, based on my conversations with Twinbrook residents, that there is great need in Twinbrook. And in addition to the steps that uh, our moderator mentioned, I would add uh, better police enforcement. And I mentioned before the chronic running of stop signs and the chronic speeding and the chronic weight violations. I, that's why I proposed a new measure of citizen effectiveness when the city staff, whatever, police or whomever take, take an action that we... Council Member Prashela, Virginia Onley, ca uh, mayor, a council candidate. Um, actually, I would support that money being used in, in Twinbrook. I certainly have um, donated a lot of money to the fund uh, for, <laughs> for speed cameras in actually in all jurisdictions, not just in <laughs> So I don't discriminate against, against where I speed. But I, but I would support the money being spent here in Twinbrook. Thank you. So we've got Leadfoot Onley, and we've, <laughs> and we've got Mark Prashela, Livestrong Armstrong here running for mayor. Okay. Uh, Claire Whitaker, why don't you go next, please? Well, we could solve the problem of where to, to put it if we kept moving those speed cameras. We could uh, allocate it anywhere we wanted to. And actually, we probably would make a lot more money if we did move them around because I've learned where they are, and I guess most people have. I'm, I'm pretty careful in those spots, unlike Virginia. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Um, Beryl Feinberg, please. Uh, for one thing, I would want to be c 
careful because what has been shown, of course, the county imposed the speed cameras before the city did, is that the revenues traditionally go down. Behaviors change. Virginia, your foot will be easier. Um, <laughs> and anybody else in this room. I mean, we have seen over the years the revenues do decline. So I don't, would not want to use that money for ongoing expenses such as increased police officers because of the issue of the declining revenue. On the other hand, would I want to put those um, pedestrian safety improvements and traffic improvements in Twinbrook? Sure, I, of course I would want to put them in here so that as part of our uh, related public safety improvements, we are using those who have paid the way from their lead feet um, towards improvements in Twinbrook and other areas. I think we would also have to identify and look at what are the top, say, 10 pedestrian safety areas within the city. Thank you. Thank you. Nicely done, right there. Don Hadley, you're next. There's a margin of, I think, seven miles per hour uh, on the speed cameras in Rockville. I think we've been told that by our police rep. 11. 11. Oh man, I can step on it. It's 11. I, I've had a few. My, my thought is two things. We're talking about where the money goes, but also to me there's a, a question of how the money arises. And I think the issue most people have had with speed cameras is the element of surprise, that they aren't really clearly marked. Their presence does slow you down. I think that there's more public safety that results from knowing that they're there than from people slowing down to avoid tickets. Uh, and I think the, the I, I'm happy for Twinbrook to be funded, but I think Twinbrook should be funded without having to resort necessarily to special funds. If this is one that's available, fine. Uh, I think other communities could say, well, then give us more speed cameras so we can get, you know, there's, there's an equality of distribution here that's gonna happen no matter how you do it. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, Council Member Tom Moore. I'm going to disagree with the premise of the question to a certain extent. Uh, as Mark said, the Department of Public Works really does work hard to make sure that their, the money gets spent where the need is greatest. So I, I don't think they're playing favorites with neighborhoods around the city. Um, by my calculation, the West End kicks in just fine. I think I personally have paid for about half a block of brick sidewalks <laughs> as I drive my six kids in my minivan. So on a per person basis, it's not so bad. Um, we are spending other money um, on uh, pedestrian safety th throughout the city. Uh, Senator Jenny Forehand brought home an awful lot of highway user money for us this year, and we're going to be spending about I think it's $750,000 in the next year on, uh, on handicapped-friendly pedestrian signals, the ones that speak to you. Um, so it's, it's not that the speed camera money is the only money that we're spending on this, and this has been a priority. Um, pedestrian safety has been a priority in this city for a long time. Bicycle safety, um, we've, we've done our best to build good bike paths, the Millennium Trail around the city, and one of the main things that we're trying to do with the Pike Plan is to make it more pedestrian friendly, pedestrian safe, and bicycle safe and bicycle friendly. Um, so speed cameras are an important part of that, but they're not the only part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And last, uh, Julie Polakovich Carr. Well, I certainly agree that uh, the city should be spending money on pedestrian safety initiatives and having walked through Twinbrook I've seen the streets that are missing sidewalks so clearly there is need in this neighborhood. Um, I would be concerned about tying the funds from particular speed cameras to that neighborhood. Um, certainly the city should be taking an equitable view of the entire city, city but it could actually create some perverse incentives where you have a neighborhood that's getting covered by speed cameras so that they can increase the revenues to, to pay for uh, for pedestrian improvements in those in that neighborhood. So again, I think the city staff uh, has implemented some procedures to actually prioritize some of these things, like where sidewalks go in, but perhaps we're underfunding those programs if it's not happening soon enough for certain neighborhoods. Thank you, Julie. Uh, I think in addition to electing leaders, we're also electing people, as Claire said. These are people, these are residents, they're, they're parents, they're sisters and brothers, they're friends, they're hardworking people and activists. I love, when I say a sentence, I mean it, a sentence. Tell us about a cause, a charitable cause that you support personally with your time and or money. And it can be Rockville located, it can be county located, it can be national or international. But I know as a voter, I'd be curious particularly about a local cause that you care about. But if there's not one, any cause is fine. So let's start with our mayoral council and then we'll come down the line here. So Mark, Councilmember Prashela, tell us one cause, one sentence. 
Mothers Against Drunk Driving because a high school friend of mine was killed in a drunk driving accident, which he was responsible for, and that's, that's why I support that. Thank you. Councilmember Newton. I believe very much in the biblical verse, to whom much is given, much is also expected. And since being elected in 2009, I've donated my stipend to Rockville Housing Enterprises. Thank you. Claire, come, start us down the line. Um, I think com Community Ministries is one of the the best organizations in this city uh, for serving the people, and I support it. Thank you. Don Hadley. Um, I would hesitate to point out a single organization that we support, but I think most important in my heart are just the families that we know and personally work with. Thank you. Julie Palakovich Carr. The Montgomery County SPCA, we've fostered several dogs for that organization. If anyone's looking to adopt a very sweet beagle, we have one in our home right now who's <laughs> looking for a home. There's a commercial message. <laughs> Thank you. Beryl Feinberg. From the moment we're born, we're all going to die. I have had personal experience with uh, Montgomery Hospice, Hospice at Home, and Casey House. And I currently serve as chairman of the board of Montgomery Hospice in the county. And it is my absolute passion. Thank you. Councilmember Tom Moore. Uh, the Rainbow Place Shelter, it's a uh, project of the Rockville Presbyterian Church. Uh, it is the, it's on my block. Um, it is a, a nighttime winter women's shelter, uh, and it just does great life-saving work. Um, they Thank need you. volunteers. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I'm trying to enforce. Virginia Allen. These are such, these are, these are such good guy things. I hate to be mean about something so great, but anyway, Virginia Allen. On the fourth Wednesday of every month, I go with St. Mary's Church to Potomac Valley Nursing Home, and we take Mass, which, which is our church service, and communion to the residents of Potomac Valley. Awesome. Every one of them. Great causes. Thank you for sharing those. And now, as you're, yeah, let's do that. Community Service Day is coming up, uh, October 26th. Where will you serve? Montgomery uh, volunteers. Uh, great opportunity. If you're not currently volunteering somewhere in this area, please consider choosing uh, a cause that you heard about here or finding one online and give back of your time, of your resources, of all that we've been blessed to receive. And you guys have been so well behaved. We're going to have time for, I'm looking at Kim. We have time for a one minute wrap up, one minute closing statement, I think. I can't say. One minute. That's a yes. Okay. We have time for one minute closing statements, which weren't originally allocated. Um, I'm going to start with our mayoral candidates, and then we will go up the line this time. So, uh, Council Member Mark Prashela, why don't you lead in one minute, please? Steve? Thank you for coming out tonight. Thanks to the TCA for hosting and for Cheryl for being our moderator. Tonight, you've had a chance to see where I and Council Member Newton stand on the issues. We have substantive, philosophical, and stylistic differences, and I would say you truly have a choice. When you make your choice for mayor, you need to look deep in your heart and decide what kind of mayor you want. I will bring together all parts of the city. That is how we will solve our problems. I will look for new solutions for handling growth, and I will diversify our economy. I will clearly state our goals and make a plan for the next two years. I will bring a calm and fact-based approach to our initiatives and our decision-making. I will respect everyone before us. My website is votepershela.org. On my website, I have two documents plus a lot more. First is my platform, 12 pages. You will see what I stand for. The second platform, four pages, how I would go about conducting myself as mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Prashela. And now, Council Member Bridget Newton. Thank you. I hope that your observations of my conduct, my positions, and my efforts on behalf of Rockville over the past four years have convinced you that I'm the best candidate for the position of mayor. I'd like to clarify a couple points. I did not vote against Choice Hotels. I abstained. Why anybody knows what happened in executive session is beyond me, but it's important that you know that my reason for abstaining was because I didn't think that an $8 billion publicly traded company with access to the capital markets should be getting money from Rockville. We have other ways to incentivize. I also voted um, against Rockville Housing Enterprises because it didn't come before the mayor and council, and I didn't know until the end of July that this was going to come. As Virginia can tell you, neither did Rockville Housing Enterprise know that the decision had been made. Um, I also did not vote against reissuing our bonds. 
I voted for it. It's a unanimous decision. You can check the website. The meeting was on February 4th, 2013. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Newton. And now the council candidates, uh, starting with Virginia Onley, please. Okay. I believe in serving all of Rockville's neighborhoods equally. I want to build trust and lasting partnerships with elected officials, with staff, and with the community, and especially Twinbrook. I've served the city for 20 years, and on all the projects, task force that I've worked on, we have done something that has moved us forward. I promise that you can trust me to roll up my sleeves and do what's best for this entire city. I am committed to serving you. I do want to mention that Rockville Housing Enterprise did not borrow money from any government agency. It's all private funded. That's very important because people thought that the city spent $36 million. Um, if you want to lo learn more about me, please visit my website, voteVirginiaOnly.org. You can also email me at VirginiaCares at VoteVirginiaOnly.org. And thank you for listening this evening. This has been a fun debate. Thank you, Virginia Onley. Next, uh, Council Member Tom Moore, candidate for Council. It's, it's no accident that Mark circled back to Fireside, and it's no, no accident that I'm circling back to Fireside. I think it was the finest thing that this mayor and council did. We protected 236 moderate income families from having their rents jacked up by a, a private developer who wanted to come in and do that. Um, you've heard a lot of diversity on this side of the table on, um, on a lot of issues tonight. There's no diversity of opinion on this one. I supported it. Mark supported it from her seat on the RHE board. Virginia supported it. Beryl supported it. Julie supported it. Councilmember Newton fought hard against it. Um, she has her reasons for it. Um, I, all I can say is supporting this is one of the things I am absolutely most proud of. It was, you know, those families were in peril, and through Rockville Housing Enterprises, we saved them. Um, Thank you for having us tonight, and uh, this has been a terrific debate. Thank you, Council Member Moore. Uh, Beryl Feinberg, candidate for Council. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Thank you very much for having us. I have been working in public policy formation, public budgeting, public finance for more than two decades. I will bring that experience, and, and, and I have already brought that experience, to the city, serving on the Finance and Budget Task Force on the Rockville Summit, and serving for seven years on the city's Board of Elections. I am known throughout the county uh, in my service to the county, working with county council members, working with council staff, and senior elected and county officials, being a can-do person, results-oriented, consensus builder, working with all stakeholders. I will do that for the city of Rockville as well. I will also promise you that I will recuse myself should there be any conflicts of interest because I am the only one of us who is a county employee. Uh, I promise to work tirely for Rockville and I will represent the interests of everyone in the city and I would like to promote and engage more actively the diverse populations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beryl Feinberg. Uh, Julie Polakovich carr council candidate. I've spent the past six months talking to residents from all across Rockville. While knocking on more than 4,000 doors, including hundreds and hundreds here in Twinbrook, I've heard time and again that Rockville is a great place to live, work, and raise a family. Residents tell me that they value the excellent services provided by the city, but I've also heard concerns about traffic congestion, new development, pedestrian safety, school overcrowding, property taxes, and the environment. If elected, I will be your advocate on these issues and others. I will work with the mayor and other members of the council to represent the needs of all of Rockville as we make key decisions about the future of our community. My professional experience at a nonprofit on Capitol Hill and on numerous citizen advisory bodies has prepared me to lead the city and to carefully weigh the long-term consequences of council actions. The decisions we make today affect not just the community we live in, but the community that our children will inherit. Thank you. Thank you, Julie Polakovich Carr. Now we've already heard from Council Member Pershela, candidate for mayor, and Council Member Bridget Newton, candidate for mayor. So the next person will be candidate uh, count for Council Don Hadley. As a non team for Rockville candidate, that doesn't mean I'm not for Rockville. <laughs> I am for Rockville. I hope you'll keep that in mind in your voting selections. I would hope to add balance to this election that there would be a voice 
that looks deeper and that brings nuance and it consults with the community and doesn't rush headlong into conviction before the community has time to think of what the conviction is. I believe that we're, we could rush into mistakes. I mean, we all remember Rockville Mall. We also remember the second iteration of Rockville. And I feel, you know, Kenny Rogers had a song in the 80s, which was, don't fall in love with a dreamer, he'll only break your heart. Well, I think we're dreaming about urbanization. There's nothing wrong with urbanization. It's how we do it and the extent uh, and the scale and the pace and how you pay for it. I think those are questions that have to be answered before we can buy it lock, stock, and barrel. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Don Hadley. And now wrapping us so, up, council candidate Claire Marcuccio Whitaker. Is, uh, obviously, I'm the last, and I, I have to make it fast because everybody wants to go home. But I would say I remember a song that is true to my ears, and that is... Uh, why can't you love me like my dog loves me? <laughs> I thought that that was funny because he's making a silly joke, so I don't know. But in any event, I want to address the fact that uh, the, the question was that we <laughs> West End, uh, there was a suggestion that all, all, so many of the candidates were from West End and that that was a bad thing. Well, indeed, I was born and grew up in East Rockville, and I'm proud of that. I had parents that had really nothing when uh, when they were when I was young, I I, I I wore clothes that were made out of chicken feed sacks, and I'm proud of that. And I became I went to to Lone Oak here in the upper part, I guess you would say of of uh, Twinbrook, and Maryvale, and Richard Montgomery, and my father said you got to go to law school. It's the most important thing because you know thank you he believe that. So thank you, Claire. I'm the American dream. Okay, that was Claire Whitaker. So hold on one sec. We're almost done. I just want to wrap up. I'd like to thank the Twinbrook Citizens Association for hosting this and for crafting these questions that I think were tough, but fair and individually uh, focused. I want to thank the terrific team of uh, Rockville's TV Channel 11, where you're either watching it live or might be watching a taped version if we ever figure out how to get to that. Uh, sounds like starting with YouTube is a good place to go, so check that out. Uh, if you didn't get to see the whole thing and are just tuning in now, I want to acknowledge uh, Mayor Phyllis Marcuccio, uh, Senator Jenny Forehand, First Lady, former First Lady Barbara Duncan, and everybody for who has helped lead Rockville and the county to be the great place to live, work, and raise a family. Um, again, if you tweet, uh, at Rockville 11 or at Rockville 411 is a great place to follow along on city issues. There is one more televised debate and I'm not moderating it. <laughs> All this, this highly paid stuff that I do, you know. Uh, but it's a League of Women Voters debate, so look for that. There are also other non-televised debates. You should definitely do your homework before voting on November 5th, and, uh, and make sure that you understand the issues, including the referendum questions, which, as you could see, were uh, closely, uh, closely divided, and there are good reasons on both sides. So see what you think is the right decision. Um, Again, please make sure you vote on November 5th. I'm Cheryl Kagan. Thank you so much for paying attention. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for watching at home. Let's give these great candidates a round of applause. candidates running for City Council this year. Council members Bridget Newton and Mark Prashela are running for Mayor. Six candidates are running for four Council seats and they are Beryl L. Feinberg, Donald H. Don Hadley, Tom Moore, Virginia Onley, Julie Polakovich Carr, Claire Marcuccio Whitaker. Polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. For polling locations, special transportation options, and other election information, go online to rockvillemd.gov slash election13. Keep it on Rockville 11 for the most news on the city election, including candidate statements, debates, and results.